Well, good evening, everyone. Just a quick sound check before we uh, get going. Fabulous. Thank you very much. So uh, welcome back. So it's week five already. This is really um, flying by, isn't it? So one way to, to, to get rid of lockdown is to um, put on something like this every week. Plenty of work involved in it anyway. So um, here we are, week number five. Uh, to talk about the uh, the humble tea wave tonight, uh, there's a fair bit to cover, but but um, I'm fairly confident this one will um, will at least finish on time. Um, I can't see this running over too much like we have done the last couple of weeks, so um, which is which is hopefully good news. So few people still arriving, so it's good to see actually um, quite a few more this week, which is which is really nice. So thanks all for for spending your your Monday evening with us and uh, coming along and supporting. The, uh, the webinar that we've been producing. So for those of you that uh, I see a lot of the familiar faces, which is which is great. Welcome back, guys. Thank you for, for coming every week. Um, and uh, I see quite a lot of new faces, actually, as well. So that's really good. So um, for those of you that haven't been along before, welcome. This is um, a live and, and interactive um, webinar series. Um, so the first one, as, as you as hopefully you're, you're all expecting, is, is on ECGs. So this is episode five. For those of you that haven't been able to um, join us on the live webinars the last few weeks, you can catch up online on our website, www.stctrainingsolutions.co.uk. Um, if you go to the CPD section, there's a catch up section there. We're updating that every week um, with the, the previous week's videos. So you can always catch up there and on our YouTube channel. Um, there's links uh, on our Facebook as well um, if you're struggling to find them or just drop us an email. Um, so the ECG webinar series um, to tonight is, is going to be the T-Wave. We've already covered subjects um, such as bundle branch blocks, AV blocks um, and ACS last week. Um, so a bit about me, I'm Innes, I'm a paramedic practitioner. I work in a doctor's surgery by day and uh, work um, for a couple of the ambulance trusts in the local area. Um, in my spare time, which is um, few and far between at the moment. Um, so on the side of all that, we run STC Training Solutions um, between us, uh, originally set up last year as a first aid training company, but we've kind of branched out um, as planned. We, we look to do the, the, the FREC range of courses, which you'll hear about a bit more in a minute, and uh, of course, um, webinar, uh, webinar series for um, healthcare professionals. So, such as these. So um, ECGs is the first in, in a long line. Hopefully we'll, um, we'll be talking about uh, the future as, as we come to the end of this series, but there's still a few more of uh, ECG subjects to cover yet. So um, lovely. So uh, just gone seven o'clock. Um, good to see so many of you here. I'm sure there'll be a few more drop in uh, late recruits. There, there always is. So we'll get going. Um, so um, thanks for joining and we'll, uh, we'll crack on then. Okay, so um, for those of you that uh, have just joined, and, and of course, obviously, we're providing these free of charge. The, the whole aim is that we, we get people engaging with, with our brand, STC Training Solutions. And obviously, I know a large proportion of you are, are going to be of the, of the FREC variety. So um, uh, kind of we, we do offer a range of courses um, to suit you guys. So for those of you that haven't embarked on the, on the FREC journey yet or, or are looking for somewhere to start, we do offer the FREC 3 which is a nice introductory course. We have one of those running on the 18th of July over three weekends. That is filling up quickly though. So um, if you're interested in, in joining that, do drop us an email at sales at stctrainingsolutions.co.uk. Um, for those of you that have FREC3 already and need to renew, we've got one of those courses coming up in just a couple of weeks. Um, we've got medical gases, if any of you want to add Pentanox on, or if you want to make the jump to FREC4, we've got a new course starting on the 8th of August. That is looking like it's going to sell out any day now, though. We've had a huge amount of interest in suite since we released that update, which is brilliant news. So if you are keen on the FREC4, drop us an email. We will be running more this year. Um, again, for the FREC4s, if you want to add on uh, uh, life-saving meds, um, again, we have that course starting in, in a couple of weeks' time, 20th of June, Saturday and Sunday. It's over two, two days. Again, that is, I think, this evening going to sell out. We've we've um, we've had a lot of interest, particularly the last couple of days in that course. So, um, again, we will be running more later in the year. But drop us an email if you're interested. And of course, ILS, uh, not just for Fret Four. That's for all healthcare professionals that are joining us this evening. It's an annual um, kind of refresher. Uh, we go into um, well, ILS. It's, it's what it says on the tin, really. But we do uh, mechanical ventilation as part of that. We can do um, manual defib. We do obviously the H's and C's. We'll do I gels. We've got all the 
brand new top of the range equipment to, to show you how all this stuff works. So come and join us on one of those in the future, as I say, sales at STC for, for anything to do with that, or, or give us a ring. So that's the plug over. We'll uh, get on with the uh, the evening. So um, for those of you that haven't come before and, and those of you that have, just a quick reminder, we want you to be as interactive as possible. The more people that engage with these, the more fun they are, the more we learn, because actually I'm guaranteeing if, if you've got something in your mind that you want clarifying, somebody else out there probably will. So if you if raise the question, and um and we can um we can get that answered for you so um the zoom chat is probably the easiest uh, way to to get hold of us stc admin team uh, aka charlotte is in there at the moment um answering all your questions i can see her typing away frantically um you can whatsapp us as well we've got that open 07535 um, tweet us STC training limited and email uh, webinars STC. Now that that uh, isn't just tonight. That's for anything. You know, if you, if you want to get in touch with us later in the week, um, you are uh, more than welcome to get in touch. So we use Mentimeter as we go through to make these as, as interactive as possible. So um, it allows us to ask questions and for you guys to uh, have a little quiz. And, and as I say, the more the more of you that engage with this, the more you're going to learn, and, and the more fun it is for everybody else. So. Um, grab a smartphone, have it with you, um, go to menti.com and uh, you'll be given a code to put in when we when we get to that relevant section. So um, on we go then. So tonight, um, so we're following on from acute coronary syndromes that we talked about last week. Uh, and the T-wave has a big part to play. And hopefully as, as we go through tonight, that will make a bit more sense how the T-wave can actually tell us quite a lot about our patients. So um, we'll start with what is the T-wave? Just a quick refresh for those of you that weren't here week one um, to see all the waves and things like that. Uh, we'll talk about different morphologies, different shapes of T-wave, what they mean, what they can be caused by. Everything's a bit of an inexact science with ECGs, as I'm sure you're aware, but it gives you if, if you, if you have a good idea of what differentials can cause different things, you can start to build a pretty good picture about what's wrong with your patient when, when things go wrong. Hyperacuity, as in, you know, too big. Um, T-wave inversion, upside down, flip T's, whatever you want to call them. Uh, Wellens syndrome and de Winter T waves are, are two important uh, diagnoses not to miss, but unfortunately they don't generally come up in in routine ECG training. They certainly didn't in my even in my paramedic training. We didn't talk about Wellens or or de Winter T's, which I think is um, a bit of a shame, really, because we they're probably uh, ones you don't want to miss. Uh, Precordial T wave balance. Just a quick uh, refresher on that. It's a, it's a phrase that's banded around sometimes, and uh, we'll we'll go through that. And then of course. The usual Q and A session at the end, which is uh, the floor is open to you. You can ask what you like, and uh, we'll go through. I'll try and answer as many questions uh, as I can for you. So let's flash back to next week. Those of you that weren't here, then then it's a bit of a uh, get your brain in gear, have a little think about what's going on here. So uh, hopefully, no surprises um, with the diagnoses at the end of this. But 60-year-old male calls 999, sudden onset chest pain half an hour ago. He wasn't doing anything. Um, Diane's here. Hello, Diane. <laughs> um, so he's got a, a past medical history of uh, hypertension, hypercholesterol, and he's pre-diabetic. So he's got some cardiac risk factors for sure. Um, he's uh, overweight. He smokes and he drinks daily. So um, pretty much every ambulance person you're ever going to meet then, isn't it? The only difference is he's called 909, so he can't possibly work for the ambulance service. He'd never do that to himself. So. Um, no infection or trauma history. <laughs> Um, he looks pale, sweaty, and in discomfort when you arrive. So I, I'm hoping that your brains are all getting into the same kind of idea that this might be some cardiac problem um, that's that's going on here. So um, you do some obs, uh, well, your your crewmate gets the ECG ready. So uh, respirator 24, SATs 94, heart rate 69 and regular, blood pressure a little high at 160 over 99, uh, temperature 35.9, BM at 12.6. Fabulous BB, you're thinking along the right lines. We're we're getting into cardiac territory, aren't we? So uh, your your crewmate gets these ECG lays on. Uh, they've watched our, our previous session, so they know exactly where to put the dots, and uh, they get this ECG come out, and we all go, "Oh my goodness!" And we start to think about what what are we going to do for this lovely patient who is um, quite clearly having some kind of catastrophic cardiac event going on at the moment and he's, he's obviously not very well i'm just going to flick to the next slide folks so grab your smartphones this is an interactive question um answers are going to go on um on in uh, onto mentimeter so grab your smartphones log into menti.com when it asks you for the code 67136 charlotte's going to put it in the chats and i will flick back to the the previous slide there's two questions on on this uh, ecg 
little mint tea. I forgot the tea. Oh. Don't go. Don't go to mini.com. I don't know what that's. I don't know what they sell there. I can't vouch for the quality of their their interactive tools. There you go. Try that one. Menti.com. Six seven one three six. Have a look at this. So we've got a chap with some cardiac sounding chest pain, I, I would suggest, and we've got an ECG that flies out at you there. Um, the first question is, what type of MI is this? So do get voting. There's plenty of you on tonight, so we expect to see a good turnout on the uh, on the Menti meters. So what are we seeing in this ECG? Let's get a few more of you voting. Six, seven, one, three, six. There's no reason why at least 20 of you should be voting tonight. <laughs> be as interactive as you can. So have a look. Is this an inferior MI? Is this a lateral MI? Is this a um, anterior MI? Or is this a posterior MI? It will take a bit of thought. I don't have an opinion on that. Well, well Siri doesn't have an opinion on that, apparently. So <laughs> it's all going well tonight, isn't it? <laughs> If Siri doesn't know, we're screwed. Oh, goodness. Now, now this Siri's going off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lovely. Let's see where most of you are going. So, uh, Okie dokie, most of you going with anterior MI. So just have another look at the ECG there. So is this anterior, lateral, inferior or posterior? We know it's an MI. And then the second part of the question, folks, um, I'll just get that up and down, is, is how are we going to confirm your diagnosis? Um, and when I say how are we going to confirm the diagnosis, we're going to say um, how, you know, what's, what's the kind of first line you're going to do? Because actually there's, there's probably, there's three correct answers here, but one of these is, is what you're going to do first of all to confirm what you're thinking. So, well done, a few of you voting there, fantastic. So you've seen your ECG, you've decided what type of MI um, we're having, and now we're going to vote on what's the first thing we're going to do to confirm what we're thinking is right. Are we going to do a V4R? Are we going to check for raised troponin? Are we going to check V789? Are we going to do angiography? Are we going to um, give him some GCN and then try the ECG again in the hope that we've deleted all evidence? <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm going to go back to the first question. So um, a lot of you going for anterior MI. I see a couple of you maybe have cottoned on uh, to actually what's going on here. So I'm going to show you the correct answer if it will let me. So um, fantastic. So 45% of you going for anterior MI. Okay, let's just flick back to the ECG. The, and in this case, the, the anterior leads are depressed. So remember in, in um, myocardial infarction, you're looking for elevation. We do see a little bit of elevation in the in, inferior leads, but we don't see it in consecutive leads. If you see lead three is actually relatively normal. So leads, lead one and lead AVF are elevated. Sure, I'll give you that. Lead V5 and V6 are, are looking a bit weird, aren't they? Um, I wouldn't quite go as to far as to say V5 is elevated. V6, I think, is lead one is is certainly getting there so so there's there's something weird going on with this heart isn't there it's not quite an inferior mi i think i think there might be some lateral wall involvement but it's not a lateral mi it's not an anterior mi so that gives us posterior as as our option okay and remember the diagnostic criteria for posterior mi was anterior st depression with with level st depression um so yeah, anterior ST depression with with a level ST segment uh, and a positive T wave with with uh, with good R wave progression. So we can make the diagnosis from the CCG. This is a really good example of a posterior MI. And of course, how are we going to um, prove that? We're we're going to do V seven, eight, and nine. Actually, so yes. Yeah, so I agree. There's three correct answers here. The correct answers here are check for raised troponin um, and and angiography are both correct. Um, we will we will repeat the ECG post GTM, but that's not actually going to give us a diagnosis. 
your your actual diagnosis here is it's a posterior MI and we're going to prove that by doing V7, 8 and 9, your posterior leads. Um, and and that should show us um, some some ST elevation in theory, shouldn't it? So uh, lovely. So that's the ECG back there. Nice posterior MI diagnosed by anterior ST depression with with the flat ST segments uh, and good R wave progression, positive T waves. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, Matt uh, nailed it. Yeah, you can't do your troponin or andrography at the back of the truck. But then again, this patient may have presented to you in the A and E department where you work you may have a cath lab next door but the first line is always going to be a, a v789 that's the quickest way to say okay this is definitely a posterior um some will argue once you've made the diagnosis it's not necessary but um happy days um what would it have been if anterior had been elevated it would have been an anterior st um elevation mi in that case john so if the anterior sts had been up that that is the definition of anterior STEMI. This in this case is, is a posterior wall STEMI and, and this what you're seeing on, on the anterior leads is, is reciprocal change. Fantastic. Okay. Hey, we seem to have lost a picture. Hang on, this this did this earlier and I think it's to do with Mentimeter um, playing up. So I might just have to reboot for a minute, folks. I do apologize. Okay. Bear with. Um, we, we like using Mentimeter, but unfortunately it makes PowerPoint quite unstable. So do bear with me while we just get this um, up and running again. Oh, what happened there? Okay. Fantastic. Sorry, uh, everybody. Let's just flick back to where we were. Technology is against us tonight. Siri's having an argument in the corner and, and Mentimeter's making everything crash. So, okay, there we go. That looks a bit more like it. Fab, back in the room. So, um, what is the T-wave, first of all? The T-wave is um, the repolarization of the ventricles, isn't it? We, we learned that in week one. The T-wave is here. It should look like a bit of a roller coaster, so a kind of gentle upslope and a steep downslope uh, returning to baseline. Um, it should start isoelectric, um, and, that's, and that's what we look at with your, with your J-point, where, where your S-wave becomes a T-wave. Um, and, and it should be uh, a fairly consistent um, length uh, as in uh, kind of time from from the q wave to the t wave should be fairly constant at around less than 450 milliseconds we said didn't we in in, in adults we'll look at qt um in in just a little while so the the common question we we, we get asked when uh, when we look at t waves in any detail is if the qrs so remember from from our axis discussion the qrs complex is is traveling in a general downward direction towards lead two and it's going to give this predominantly positive um, deflection in, in, this is a lead two rhythm strip we're looking at here. So in, in lead two, it's gonna give a, posi a relatively positive um, uh, deflection. So a lot of people get a little bit confused with the T waves because the, the T wave is repolarization as opposed to depolarization. So it's a negative voltage. So would you not expect it to, to be a negative uh, wave? Uh, and actually we did we did a little bit of looking into this because it confused me when I first learned about it as well. And, and actually it's because the myocytes they, they depolarize from, from inside out. So they depolarize from the epicardium, sorry, from the endocardium to the epicardium, whereas they repolarize in reverse. So they repolarize from the epicardium towards the endocardium. So of course you, you have a negative moving in a negative direction, two negatives makes a positive. And, and that is why predominantly speaking that the T wave is, is a positive. I hate that uh, that kind of makes sense, but it, but it took me a while to, to kind of understand the concept of why, why the T waves don't go in the opposite direction of the QRS complexes. Um, and that's why, so predominantly speaking, your T waves should travel in the same direction as, as the QRS um, complex, if it's predominantly uh, positive, as, as in this case. So we'll look at what's normal. So um, we, we kind of hinted there, so a normal T wave should look a bit like a roller coaster. So nice, gentle kind of climb up, and then you're, you're crashing dive bomb back down to isoelectric lines. So we shouldn't see symmetrical T waves. A symmetrical T wave is, is always um, pathological. 
So first rule is they've got to be asymmetric. They've got to be kind of, as I say, up, you know, shallow upslope, steep downslope. They should be positive in, in every lead um, except AVR. So AVR is the only one, well, there's a couple, as I say, below, there's a couple of exceptions. But generally speaking, you, you should be looking to check that they are definitely negative in AVR. They should generally be broadly positive in, in all other leads. Okay. So, so they can be they can be negative or positive in lead three. Okay, lead three is is our is our kind of uh, millennial lead. It can be whatever it wants to be. Okay, so um, it can be positive. It can be negative. Um, v one um, it, it V one should generally be pretty flat. If anything, just slightly positive. A tall T wave in V one is abnormal. We'll we'll talk about that later. And and obviously a deep um, a deep negative T wave in in lead V one is is abnormal as well. In all other leads, you should see nice positive T waves. So we can see positive, positive, nothing. Positive, positive, yeah, slightly positive. All the others are nice and positive. AVR is negative, which is where it should be. So we talk about the biggest size. So in, in the limb leads, no more than five uh, millivolts. That's five five squares from baseline. There's there's no big T waves in there, uh, and no more than ten in the in the chest leads, uh, the precordials, and and you can see. V2 is your biggest uh, your biggest T wave there, and it's definitely below 10 uh, millimetres. And a normal QTC, uh, we do come onto the QTC uh, as, as if by magic. There's the next one, so don't get too bogged down by this. It's there if you need to, if you want to know it. It's certainly not a need to know. All ECG machines nowadays will calculate a QTC for you. Um, this is just kind of information on, on how they do that. So your your QT interval is is measured from the start of the Q wave to the end of the the T wave. There's there's no there's no um, trick question there at all and at a rate of 60 beats per minute the QT is is exactly the same as the QT corrected the QT corrected QTC is is just the QT corrected for rate as it says at the top there um, and your QTC is inversely proportional to the heart rate so as your heart rate goes up your QT on on the actual printout will come down so then you have to correct it for the actual corrected QTC that, that's basically all we're doing and and the and the computer will use a, a couple of fairly um, difficult to comprehend formulas there. So the one I was taught was the Bazet formula, which is um, just the, the the QT that you measure um, is is uh, you divide that by the square root of the RR interval. So the RR interval is in millimeters on your ECG. Find the square root of that. Divide QT by that number, and you've got your QTC. That's accurate through normal heart rate. Okay. As you step out of that, there's the, the, the Friedrich formula, which is slightly more complex. Um, but um, I do challenge you to, to do this on the road one night, um, preferably with somebody that hasn't watched the CCG webinar. I'd like them to present you the, uh, the Friedrich Chia formula um, and an ECG and, and let them crack on. Probably about half past two in the morning, I think. Maybe give it to your ECAs um, to, to work on for a few weeks if you don't want to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> so that um, if, if the if the heart rate's abnormal, um, 8.22 um, multiplied by the cubic root of the RR interval um, and watch their face drop <laughs> like it did mine when I tried to work one out earlier. So, but it's there. That's that's probably what the system uses the Friedrich here um, formula to calculate because it's it's accurate through all the uh, through all the ranges. So fab. So that's QT intervals. Uh, the table in the middle is probably the most useful part of this because the system works it out for you. That's mean. I know, Diane. They've got to learn, they haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> got to earn their cake. So um, up to 450 predominantly is, is, is normal. So long QT is possible in anything over 390, 400. I think most people are kind of sitting about 400 from, from experience. Anything over 450 or 460 in a woman, um, you're going to be considering long, long QT syndrome and it might, it might be worthwhile um, looking into that. So for very good reason. So here's an example of uh, long QT. This is what it looks like when it comes out on an ECG machine. Um, this is long QT caused by hypocalcemia. Um, the, the reason I chose that is because the, when, when you talk about other electrolyte disturbances, you get loads of other changes, but with hypocalcemia, you tend to just get QT interval changes, and that's because of the, uh, the, the rate of um, repolarization is, is delayed. If you remember back to, was it week one, where we talked about the, um, the myositic action potentials, um, if, you, if you don't have enough calcium to, to, hold, the, uh, to hold all the, the voltage-gated channels open, they, they take a long time to close, and, and of course, the, um, um, the, the depolarization phase takes, sorry, repolarization phase takes uh, a long time, and that's what gives you this long QT syndrome. So, 
The um, so yeah, you can see here the the, the QC syndrome. Pick any lead uh, you can see uh, from the start of the queue to to the end of the T is is much more than four hundred and fifty uh, milliseconds. So we are um, we are definitely in long QT syndrome here. So um, the one big side effect of long QT, hopefully um, paramedics in the room will be will be aware of it, is kind of talk to us. So um, and this is it. I think we've all had those moments, haven't we, where we've been quite happily doing an ECG or just monitoring our patient and then this happens and you go, uh -huh. <laughs> just check it's not artifacts, you know, you haven't just gone over a speed bump, this is, this is real. So um, have a little look, have a look at, uh, this is this is an example of um, uh, long, QT, long QT syndrome, secondary to hypo, uh, Kalemia. Sorry, I just have to make sure I've got the right ECG. So, yeah, this is this is long QT syndrome, secondary to hypokalemia, low low potassium, um, and uh, you can tell that because there's a fairly prominent U wave. The U wave is what this um, this uh, is what's causing this kind of notch on the T waves. Um, you have to look to see whether it's a T wave or, or a U wave. In this case, there's a very prominent U wave in each lead. U waves come out uh, in hypokalemia. All right, that's that. Uh, that's their their party, so they like to come out then. Um, and uh, and and obviously the the ECG has gone a bit uh, funny at the end here. So your next question: What is this rhythm called? You've got the choice of VF, Torsard Dupont, um, monomo monomorphic VT, atrial fibrillation with rapid rapid ventricular response, or Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. What do we think this is? cast your votes i'll flick back to the um to the previous screen so you can just have a look is this vf vt uh monomorphic vt uh torsards is this um af with rvr or is this um what was the other one um all parkinson white that was it Fantastic. So let's get some of you voting. The more that vote, the better this works. So which do you think this is? VF, TDP, VT, AF, WPW. What are we going for? I'm going to show where everybody's at. So split between TDP and monomorphic VT. Fantastic. I'm going, to f I'm going to show you the right answer, folks. So um, a good chunk of you getting this right. Torsard Dupont. Dupont is what we want to call it. <laughs> um, okay, long QT syndrome. The reason why we get excited about it is because it is um, associated with runs of polymorphic VT. And uh, this, this is a very specific type of polymorphic VT um, called Torsard Dupont. Torsards for short, or TDP. Um, it's polymorphic because the uh, the ventricular contractions are of different uh, amplitudes. So if you can see, a monomorphic VT is very much like um, sawtooth sawtooth pattern. So fantastic. So this is this is TDP, secondary to long QT syndrome. It can self resolve, but this is one of the very, the loads of reasons we do um, ECGs in patients that have had uh, a T lock and collapse. Um, so the, these can self uh, self resolve and go back into sinus rhythm. I've, I've certainly seen that happen, and um, and they you know they come round and they go, what happened? You know they just had a blackout for no obvious reason, um, and it turns out they've had uh, TDP. So not completely wrong with monomorphic VT. Not completely wrong, Diane, at all. No, um, the um, it, you're, it's VT. <laughs> um, wrong with the monomorphic. That was all. So monomorphic would be the same shape of of VT, and that's. That's the more common of the two, I would suggest, um, when we talk about cardiac arrest rhythms and things like that. So but this is a polymorphic VT and, and specifically um, GDP. So well done to the 32% that got that right. And the 37% that went for monomorphic VT, uh, you're on the right lines. Uh, it's just different shapes, so it can't be, can't be monomorphic. Um, not VF, because it's too coordinated, not AF. Um, doesn't look anything like that. And WPW, uh, we're going to talk about in a future lecture at uh, Satechi Cardia. So, lovely.
So before we go into like uh, a bit more about T-Waves, we're just going to revisit some of the other views of the heart that we've seen recently and some of the other anomalies So and, and how they affect our T-Waves. So um, T-Waves in left bundle branch block, um, you get some abnormalities. So if you remember for the last couple of weeks, we've talked uh, a little bit about left bundle branch block and Scarbosa criteria and, and how we figure those out. Um, with, with left bundle branch block, you get um, discordance, which is this phenomenon of the, um, the ST segments and the T waves going in the opposite direction from the QRS, if we, if we remember that. And we can see that quite clearly here in your anterior leads, V1 to V3 and V4 here. You can see that the QRS complexes are, are broadly negative and that your ST segments and your T waves are, are therefore positive. That's discordance. Um, so where you see abnormal T waves is, is in your lateral leads, for example, here your high laterals give a, a good example, one in AVL. Um, you have a positive QRS complex, so you expect to see a negative ST segment and a negative T wave, which is what we do. So abnormal, t so, so when, when you have a bundle branch block, kind of the rules around T waves um, go out the window a little bit. So, so you expect to see the T waves go in the opposite direction of the QRS complexes in left bundle branch block. Hopefully that makes sense. So um, don't don't look at a left bundle branch block ECG and start trying to apply the rules of, of T wave axis that we talked about on the first slide because it it won't work. So uh, and conversely in, in right bundle branch block, um, so predominantly right bundle it doesn't have so much of an effect on our cardiac axis if we if we seem to remember that. So um, so you can see that predominantly speaking your T waves are positive. Um, where you see the differences in right bundle branch block is V1 to V3. So your right precordial lead, you tend to get an ST, uh, sorry, a, a T wave inversion. You shouldn't see any change to the ST segments necessarily. Um, but, but to see um, V1 to V3 T wave inversion is not uncommon in, in right bundle branch block. Um, and that's of no reason to be concerned, particularly in a patient that looks well. If your patient's sitting there dripping in sweat, grey in colour and passing out, then, then perhaps you need to look at whether there's something going on underneath that. Um, but in this case, an ECG that showed this uh, wouldn't be positive for, for anything at all. That's that's a normal right bundle branch block pattern. That's only in V1 to V3. If you had massive ST depression and T wave inversion in the other leads, then it's a different story. So, um, there we go. The other the other time the the rules go out the window with T waves is the hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy. So your left uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and your right ventricular hypertrophy. These are going to get talked about next week, so I'm not going into too much detail. We know this ECG is is LVH um, because the, we, we, there's a voltage criteria we use to calculate it, and it's the depth of the S wave plus the highest R wave in V5 or V6. If you add them together, if they equal more than 35 millivolts, which these obviously do, they're massive, then you have left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, what you then look for is something else to support it. So you have the, the voltage criteria and the non-voltage criteria. In this case, the non-voltage criteria is, is a massive left axis deviation, which is supported by one AVF and, and lead two. They're all opposing each other. Um, in, in this case, so, so ordinarily with, with just standard left ventricular hypertrophy, you, you don't get that many T wave changes. In, in this case, we have what's called a strain pattern. And it's this strain pattern that's going to give us this kind of downward sloping ST segment with a negative T wave. And you see it really clearly in the lateral leads. Um, and that's common in left ventricular hypertrophy with strain. A strain comes about basically, it's, it's as, it, as, it, as you imagine, the, the myocytes are getting stretched and working harder than they should be. This is probably going to be an uncontrolled hypertensive patient um, that, that produced this ECG. Um, so you have LVH with strain, you're going to see some T wave anomalies. So um, this is RVH. Um, so RVH is a little bit harder to, uh, to diagnose, right ventricular hypertrophy. So you need a, a fairly sizable right axis deviation, if you remember from our, um, from our lecture on axis. So lead one and lead AVF are pointing towards each other. That's going to suggest right axis quadrant. Uh, looking around for your most isoelectric lead, AVR at the top there. So um, if, if AVR is, is most isoelectric, that's certainly pulling you around towards the, the extreme right axis deviation quadrant. So, so we have a definite right axis deviation here. So you're looking for um, dominant R waves in V1, you're looking for dominant S waves in, um, in V5 and V6. They're nearly there, they're, they're good enough for diagnosis. Um, and um, you're looking for a kind of normal width and complex because don't forget you can get those changes in right bundle branch block as well. So that it is sometimes hard to differentiate between the two. In this case, there's no RSR complex. Um, and there's no um, slurred S wave. 
so um, to differentiate it from the from the right bundle. Um, but we do see again a strain pattern, and again you generally only get the T wave changes in the strain patterns. We will talk about these more next week um, about what's actually going on. But um, you see in the in the anterior leads very uh, very clearly there um, a downward sloping ST segment with an inverted T wave. Um, and um, in, in kind of extreme strain, you start to see inferior changes. Certainly there's, um, there's some ST weirdness in lead three, isn't there? And, and there's the start of something going on in ABF. So there are, there are the kind of early stages of inferior changes. Um, and um, does anyone want to pop in the chat? Well, you know, what's, what's the kind of significance of right ventricular hypertrophy with strain, particularly where it spreads to the inferior leads? Does anyone know that one? It's, it's a diagnosis you won't want to miss. Um, but the ECG isn't isn't that specific in finding it. I'm thinking chest pain, breathlessness, perhaps reducing SATs, um, bit of leg pain in the in recent days. If anyone wants to throw in the chat, if not, PE folks is the um, so yeah, fantastic. You're going to get well done. So so the significance of 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 a right ventricular hypertrophy with a strain pattern, as as you see here, is this could actually be a PE. So you need to you need to get your history as well. This is a patient with chest pain, particularly if this is you know a younger, healthier patient perhaps, um, and they've got you know sharp chest pain. They're breathless. Their their sats are a bit low, and they've got this ECG bit tacky as the CCG is this could be a PE very easily so that's just something to throw in your, your arsenal of differentials we'll talk about that a bit more next week okay. so um, morphology so I just want to go through how you would describe a T wave so somebody asks you describe that T wave rather than saying well it's a bit up it's a bit down it's a bit squiffy you, you, you use the technical term so normal up on the top left there biphasic is where it goes up or up first or down first and, and basically it goes up and down is, is, is the biphasic uh, meaning of that. So if you look over to the right of your screen, if it goes up first, that's better than if it goes down first. Down first then up is more associated with um, infarct um, and uh, ischemia and things like that. Um, the other causes um, of biphasic um, T waves are um, potassium disturbances. So hypokalemic uh, ECGs can sometimes have biphasic waves uh, more often than not, they're kind of early stages of ischemia. Um, so when you start to see uh, a T wave that was positive go negative, you find that there's um, there's often an element of, of uh, or a period where there's some biphasic um, T waves there. So bifid or notched um, uh, T waves, we saw one of those uh, in that ECG with the with the TDP, the torsades rhythm. So this again is is uh, depicting a U wave. So this would be like a hypokalemic ECG, for example. The two reasons you get bifid or, or notched um, T waves is P's on T's. So in tachycardias, where the P wave for the next atrial contraction is occurring before this T wave is finished, that's that's normal. Um, or, or as in this case, it's being depicted a U wave on the end of the T wave, and that is normally a, a good sign of hypokalemia and needs to be investigated. Um, you know, in an ECG that's kind of going a little bit flat would be described as broad or, or a slow T wave. It can sometimes be called a flat T wave. Uh, most common cause, again, a, a lot of these, a lot of these kind of widening and flattening, they're either caused by ischemia or hypokalemia. They're your two kind of differentials when you see broadening and flattening of your T waves and, and biphasic Ts, they, they're, all, they're all pretty much the same things. Hyperkalemia on, on, the, on the flip side is going to give you very tall, very notched T waves. They look like, you know, very peaked triangles, peak Ts. They're hyperkalemic Ts, um, that's, what, that's what they're called. Um, if, if they're not kind of as notched, but they're still, um, they're still uh, symmetrical, so remember we said anything symmetrical in a T wave is abnormal. Um, it's known as repolarization variants, but but it's most commonly caused by ischemia. So again, if you see um, if you see um, your your symmetrical T waves, um, the more t the more peaks they go, the more you're going to be thinking hyperkalemia. If they're not that peaks, you're probably going to be thinking acute ischemia, and maybe it's going to be telling you something. And especially if they get really big. Um, so I think everybody's familiar with these kind of deep, um, deep symmetrical um, T waves are, are ischemic. If they're really kind of massive off the scale flip T's um, that, that go really nice and deep, don't rule out that, I mean, obviously you need to look at your patient, but the intracranial hemorrhage can cause that. So if you've got an unconscious patient that's showing some kind of neuro signs of, of herniation, et cetera, and, and you've got really deep, massive ST, uh, uh, T waves on, on your ECG, then, then certainly be thinking um, intracranial hemorrhage. That's quite a useful thing just to have in your arsenal. But again, you, you know, 
it, you're not necessarily going to be 12 lead ECGing somebody that's that's coning at the side of the road necessarily you're going to be trying to get them somewhere um so uh, strain patterns we've talked about give these kind of characteristic downward sloping st segments into a negative t that's associated with myositic stretching effectively in in um hypertrophy um and prolonged qt we've talked about um that common causes of, of long qt are sodium potassium channel um issues um ischemia so an old infarct things like that some drugs so amiodrone some of the antidepressants and and of course for us on the road, uh, a lot of trust uses uh, on dandertron. On dandertron can prolong your QT interval. Worth bearing in mind if your patient already has a long QT interval, we don't really want to give them um, torsades just to correct their nausea, really. But I suppose it's way up the pros and cons, isn't it? So, uh, so um, let's jump into this then. So what do we have here? I'm going to up the next screen it's it's like we had last week it's uh it's a word kind of puzzle that it builds so you all get to put in three answers so menti.com 67136 you can all put in three answers please do have a look at this ecg give me three possible answers excuse me to what's going on in this ecg so try if everybody if everybody has a go charles just put the uh, the link in there again menti.com 67 one three six. Have a look at the CCG. Put three answers. So we got some big old T waves in your anterior leads there. Have a look. See if you think there's SC elevation there. Have a look at your other leads. See what changes there are going on. Um, this isn't one we've covered yet, so um, I don't expect you all to know it. You're here to learn um, these these things after all, or refresh on them. So if you if you don't remember the answers, don't worry. Have a guess. Put in what you think's going on. If you saw this ECG um, with a patient with chest pain, what are you thinking? Let's see how many are are voting. Nobody yet. Oh oh no! There we go. Fantastic! Look at this. I like it when it works. Great, so there's nine of you voted. Let's get a few more of you in. Lovely. I like this, perfect. Okay. So uh, a lot of you saying uh, hyperkalemia, fantastic. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, tool tended T waves. HCM ischemia, ischemia I like. That's always a get you out of jail card, isn't it? It's an ischemic ECG. What's ischemic about it? I don't know, it's ischemic. <laughs> I've been there, I've done that. So peak T waves, absolutely, STEMI. Uh, I'm not sure I see STEMI, I'll come back to you on that one. Hyperkalemia, possibly. Hyperkalemia, possibly. I'm liking it, guys. So a lot of you are, are coming up with hyperkalemia. Now, um, I want you to, if you, if you see T waves this big, I want you to have two differentials in mind, hyperkalemia and acute ischemia. Okay, so, so you've, 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 you've got, you know, at least two of you have got the, the right answers in there. So these are what we refer to as hyperacute T waves. Okay, and, and the CCG does come up in a minute, if I can get forward. I'm giving up with technology, it's not working. <laughs> oh. Oh, we've crashed. Okay, hang on. Bear with me, everyone. Sorry. Document recovery mode. There we go. Okay. It seems to be Mentimeter, so I don't know if we um we have to um we have to go and uh, get that sorted out somehow. Okay. Share screen. Sorry, folks. Who made haircut on that? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Bear with me.
Okay, so we all voted on this. Hopefully it will come up and then it will let us go past it. Fantastic. So the majority of you are saying hyperkalemia, lots of you are saying ischemia, so that's good. There we go. So this is the slide I wanted to show you. This is the ECG. So tall peaks asymmetric um, T waves. Okay. So the more the more asymmetric they are, the less likely they are to be um, hyperkalemia. But I do want you to think, whenever you see massive tall T waves, either think hyperkalemia or impending MI. This is, this is acute ischemia going on and, and pre-infarct. So in this case, these t the, how do we tell the difference between the two? So if, they, if they're absolutely symmetrical, then, then we're going to be talking about hyperkalemia. These aren't quite symmetrical, actually. If you look in V1, that's a very good example there. There's definitely more, more, you know, a softer slope on, on the left side than there is on the right. The other giveaways here are there's some re reciprocal change. If you look in your, in your inferior leads, there's definitely some T wave changes going on there. There's some slight elevation in, in AV, um, AVL. Um, this, uh, these, these are, these are De Winter's T's. We're going to come across these in a minute. So that's definitely something you don't want to miss. Um, this is an ischemic ECG, but whenever you see ECGs this big, hyperacute T waves, you need to be thinking hyperkalemia or, or impending MI. Okay, um, and and in this particular case, um, the the next ECG on this patient was was of a full bone anterior STEMI. So, so well done to those guys that that were picking that up. So there's your two differentials of big T waves, um, and and the way you kind of split the difference is looking for reciprocal change and looking for perfect symmetry. If you have reciprocal change and, and it's not quite symmetrical, it's not going to be hyperkalemia. Okay, so that brings us nicely into Wellens. So hopefully um, you've heard of uh, Wellens syndrome before, whether or not you, you've, you've kind of really gathered what it's all about. I hadn't when, when I first heard about it. So two types, basically. Wellens is um, either biphasic or or deeply uh, deeply inverted T waves um, and, and the only the only places we're looking to make these diagnoses is in V2 and V3. So you can see on the left hand side there Wellens A pattern is, is a biphasic initially positive then uh, then negative um, T wave pattern um, and uh, and on the right hand side there is the Wellens B which is a, um, a deep and um, uh, symmetrical T wave inversion. Okay, so biphasic or deeply inverted T waves in leads V2 and V3 without any associated ST changes. So, nowhere on their ECG should there be ST elevation. Um, nowhere in the precordial lead should there be Q waves. Um, and there should be good R wave progression. I'll show you an example of what I mean by R wave progression in a minute. They're, they're the kind of diagnostic criteria. Uh, of the ECG, the diagnostic criteria of the patient are, are below. So this is a patient that's had an episode of chest pain that's currently pain free. Um, and if you have the facility to test the biomarkers, they have normal uh, myoglobin and troponin levels uh, at this stage. So this is, um, and, and I think this is a fairly common presentation to the ambulance service. I can, I can think of lots of patients I've been to that have, that have called with chest pain. You get there and they say, well, it's kind of eased off now. I think it might be a bit of angina or whether or not they're diagnosed with angina, they may you may be thinking that it sounds a bit like angina and it's easing off and and dare i say you may even especially in, in this day and age with, with well not so much now covid's dying off but in the early stages of covid we were thinking do these patients really need to go to hospital well this this is where you really don't want to miss well in syndrome okay um well in syndrome so in, if you if you were to see these classic patterns so a well in a or a well in b in a patient with this history, and, and I would dare say that this is a common history that, that we come across. It's certainly in the GP surgery, I come across this. Patients said, oh, the last few days I've been getting chest pain. I think it's my angina getting worse. Um, and, and you do the ECG, I've not come across one yet, but, but if you were to see the Wellens, this is critical stenosis of the LAD, the left anterior descending artery. And, and these patients do more often than not go on and have anterior wall MIs. You don't want to miss these. You don't want to be discharging these patients. Okay, it's not to say you, you, you can't potentially discharge some of your angina patients, but not not these ones. Okay, this this diagram at the bottom here I think shows it quite well. It's it's uh, it's um, a, a kind of dynamic finding you'll see on your ECG. So if you were to do your ECG early on, you would see well in A. Well in A doesn't hang around for long, and actually by the time we get there and do the ECGs, you're more likely to see a well in B, which is the deep. Uh, symmetrically inverted um, T waves. Okay. 
interestingly you remember in, in one of the earlier slides if it goes up then down it's the biphasic t wave is considered not as bad wellens is the nice uh, exception to that rule every rule has an exception just to confuse us doesn't it so have a look for wellens um when you when you get patients with this with this um kind of history obviously if this patient was was having uh, acute chest pain at the, at the time with with these type of s or this these these st segments we're going to potentially be talking to our friendly local CCU anyway, aren't we, to, to find out whether they're happy to take them. But, but this diagram at the bottom starts with a biphasic T, starts to become more and more inverted until eventually you have the deep symmetrical uh, Wellens B patterns. So do look out for those. Um, keep them in your arsenal. Really useful. So is it, no, not always pre-existing angina, John. Um, so perhaps I should have made that clearer. So so um, when when you're uh, so recent angina symptoms, whether or not diagnosed. So if you as a clinician listen to what they're saying and say that sounds like angina, but it's gone now. Obviously, if the patient hasn't been diagnosed with angina, you're probably not going to be thinking about leaving them at home or, or, or sending them home or whatever wherever you're working. But, but if a patient that has known angina and they're just saying to you, my angina is a bit worse, you wouldn't necessarily be rushing them into A&E either. So have a look at their ECG and have a look for these, these telltale markers. And, and then that might just change your mind about what you're, what you're going to be doing with them. And I would suggest um, they, are, they are going to speak to cardiology fairly urgently. So, fantastic. So a nice example here of, of Wellens A, as I say, less common to see Wellens A because it progresses to Wellens B. Uh, well in day here, so a nice biphasic T wave going positive first in, in leads V2 and V3. It is pleasant in other leads. As you can see, it looks a bit more like a, a well in B up in, up in V4 there, doesn't it? In all other leads, you see that the ST segments are normal. Um, and you've got good R wave progression. So R wave progression is, is that the R wave should grow in each lead up to V4 and, and V5. You can see that it is growing. It's not growing much to V3. That could just be poor lead placement. Because it's, it's jumped a lot to V4 there. So that's what we mean by R wave progression is, is the size of the R wave growing through the precordial leads. So this is a good example of Wellens A. And this is a good example of Wellens B. You're more likely to see this. I, I dare say everybody has seen an ECG uh, along these lines at some stage. Um, patients with, um, with deep um, symmetrical um t wave inversions uh, in in the anterior leads it's it's a fairly common finding you can be left with well in b waves after you've had your mi and had your stents and things like that so a lot of patients with pre-existing um cardiac um cardiac history you know substantial cardiac history are left with well in b waves um they're not always as widespread as these i, I but but if you if you were to see this in in the patient group we were just talking about your your 50 year old man that, that knows he has a touch of angina and he's saying it's getting a bit worse and he had some chest pain today and, and it's gone now. If you were to see this, don't, don't go down the route of speak, speak to your GP on Monday, you know, speak to cardiology today. So perfect. So have a look at this. So it's another one of these word walls. Let me get it. Let me get it active. Let's just hope it doesn't crash because we're nearly at the end. <laughs> So what's the ECG diagnosis? We've got the um, we've got it up and running again. Charlotte's put the link again into into the chat. Have a vote. Um, there's one correct answer here. What's the diagnosis of this ECG? Menti.com six seven one three six. How do you differentiate this from an ST depression MI? Um, so Bieber, the, the difference in, in Wellens B is the history. So as, as you say, so if, um, if a patient presents with, um, with active chest pain um, and, and they have um, flip T waves in, in the anterior leads um, that, that look like they could be Wellens, if they have active chest pain, you're gonna treat that as unstable angina or, or an end STEMI, aren't you? And, and the difference between the two is gonna be whether or not they have abnormal biomarkers. If, if they have raised myoglobin and troponin at that point, that's an end STEMI, and they need to go to the cath lab. If, if their myoglobin and troponins are normal um, and they have flip Ts and, and active chest pain, that's unstable angina. Um, perhaps still going to get urgent cardiology referral though, isn't it? Um, if, if they're pain free and they've had chest pain in the last few hours, then, then you're going to treat it as a well in B. I, arguably, I think in, in the first few stages, that's, that's always going to be the same answer for those three groups of patients is you're going to get uh, a senior team down or a cardiologist or, or somebody to come and review this patient. Um, with a view perhaps to cath lab. So hopefully that clarifies that. Um, 
and back to the CCG is, is the, there's what there's a very specific pattern here, and and it's one you don't want to miss. Um, it, it it is likely to appear in in um, cardiac guidance for a lot of ambulance trusts in the future. I know um, we talked about it in London at some length um, a couple of years ago uh, about whether or not this should be one of our cath lab entry criteria. So have a look. Impending MI, I like that. Oh, hey, look at all this, all these words. Older lady, okay, fantastic. Uh, posterior MI, myocarditis, impending MI, anterior end STEMI, hyper, um, hyperkalemia, fantastic, okay. Uh, what's going on in AVL? Let's have a look. Myocarditis, we're getting, okay. What's going on in, in AVL? Uh, AVL is, is the giveaway here, okay. Right, if you see, um, ST depression with, with uh, say, flat ST depression with a positive T wave and, and a peaked T wave like this, with subtle ST elevation in, in AVR, this is a STEMI equivalent. This is De Winters, okay? So this, and I, and I really can't believe that this isn't taught much more because we really can't miss these. Okay, in around 2%, so it doesn't sound like a lot, but actually the number of patients having MIs in the UK is on the rise um, every year, of course, because we're unhealthy. So, um, but around 2% of, of anterior wall MIs um, present with just isolated De Winters T's. Okay, the definition is an ST uh, depression with peaks, usually symmetrical T waves in any of the precordial leaves but usually most visible in v3 um and, and as i say it can occur in isolation in anterior wall mi um often in the presence of subtle st elevation in avr and we saw all of those all of those criteria that's a de winters t wave there's an example of it it's most it's most visible in in v3 this is this this patient needs um ppci okay this patient should be treated exactly the same as um as as a patient that had a full blown anterior wall mi with with st elevation coming out of their ears okay this and and um so i think those of you there's quite a few from scas joining isn't there so those of you in scas i think if you saw this that's worth that's worth a conversation with ccu um uh, I, I did see some some names that i know from london i think in this case um it's definitely worth a, a clinical on call um conversation just uh, just uh, you know Make sure this, these group of patients aren't um, aren't bypassing the the cath lab to go to an A and E department if, if that makes sense because actually they 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 are incredibly un, unstable patients. Okay, these are for all intents and purposes acute anterior wall MIs and they should be treated as such. So that is the winter C wave. I'll bring up the ECG again so you can just see it. So so your your um, anterior ST depression is generally flat. It's generally a tall peaked symmetrical T wave in your anterior leads, most visible in V3, and it's a very characteristic pattern, so commit it to memory. If you see this, a patient with chest pain looks like they're having an MI, you look up at AVR, there's some site elevation there, please, if you can, pull whatever strings you can to go to the cath lab, all right? And, and you'll probably see more of these as more patients have MIs, the 2% will obviously be uh, a larger number, won't it? So, fantastic. So, uh, did anyone actually get it? Uh, no, but hopefully if we ask that question again next week, you, you may well. So, well done. Uh, what was I? What was going on here? So, okay. Oh yes, this was just a, another example here of some de winter T waves. Um, so there we go. We can see the ST depression with the peaked, mostly symmetrical uh, T waves uh, across the anteriors, most visible with that typical pattern in V3. Some subtle ST elevation in AVR. Uh, again, do to see. Let's let's pop this patient off to. There, there was a picture of a patient having an MI. That's why it looks a bit strange. Um, we're, we're not having much luck with technology tonight. If you see this and a patient clutching their chest, give them some diesel. Get them to the cath lab. All right, fab. Um, and then the the last subject we're going to talk about tonight um, is uh, precordial T wave balance. It's a phrase that's that's bandied around. Um, I, I, again, I didn't have a clue what it meant um, uh, before before kind of looking into any of this uh, a couple of years back. But precordial T wave balance is is a sign of coronary artery disease, and and if it's and if it's new, it's ischemia. Now, what do we mean by that? So again, we talked earlier about the T wave should be flat or, or very slightly raised in V1. It can be it can be very slightly negative as well. V1 can pretty much do what it wants. 
but it shouldn't be obviously positive, okay? So when the T wave in V1 is bigger than the T wave in V6, and when we say bigger, we talk about amplitude in millivolts. If, if that's taller than that, you've got loss of precordial T wave balance. That's that's the, the diagnosis. And, and you would clock that as TT V1. So tall T wave in V1, it's a sign of coronary artery disease. Um, if it's new, I mean, if you know this patient and you did their ECG last week and they didn't have anything, and then this week they've, they've got a tall T wave in V1, if it's just popped up, it's it's a sign of acute ischemia. And again, we, we should be keeping an eye on this patient. We should be doing a cardiac workup. They, they could be, uh, it, you know, a, in some kind of unstable angina phase about to be having an end STEMI slash STEMI. So keep an eye on these patients. Always have a look at V1 to V6. If, if you've got lots of precordial T wave balance, um, there is some cardiac um, disease going on of some sort. So keep an eye on them, work them up. Um, and that is that. So let's make sure you've learned something tonight. Tell me what's going on in this ECG. Um, it's a multiple choice this time. Uh, what phenomenon can be seen here? You've got a choice of loss of precordial T wave balance, De Winter's T's, anterior STEMI, Wellens A, Wellens B. What's going on? All vote now. <laughs> Fantastic. See who you're voting. Lovely. See so some of you starting to vote. Fantastic. Have a go. What are we seeing here? Loss of pre precordial T wave balance. Are we seeing uh, Wellens A, Wellens B? Um, what were the other options? Uh, De Winters or anterior STEMI? Fantastic. Just give a few seconds for you, the rest of you to vote so it doesn't spoil it for you. Fantastic. Most of you going well in type A, some of you going well into B, some of you going loss of precordials. Let's have a little look back at it then. So loss of precordials. So there is a, there is a positive T. It's a biphasic T in V1. Uh, there is a positive T in V6. I wouldn't overly say that that's, that's a tall T only because there's this biphasic element to it, which makes it a little bit odd. So this biphasic element, you can see it's positive, then negative. It's, it's, um, it's in V2 and V3 quite clearly there. Um, we've got some, some um, V4 and V5. Uh, we've got some deep symmetrical. Uh, element to it. I don't see any changes in the ST segments anywhere else. I'm not going to call this a STEMI. Uh, I'm not going to call this De Winters because you haven't got any ST depression in, in the uh, anterior leads and we've got nothing in AVR. So it's going to be one of the Wellins. Up then down is of course Wellins type A. So well done to the 64% of you uh, who I've, I've taught something to that's fantastic. Or did you just know it before? <laughs> well done anyway. Fantastic. So that's it, folks. And I, we, we've overrun by three minutes, which is a lot better than, than normal. So we're, I'm getting better at this, hopefully in time for our uh, safe administration of life-saving meds course, so I don't go on by three hours. <laughs> so um, Charlotte's very kindly um, put up the, the review thing. So that, that's the end of this lecture. Um, so before all of you rush off, we are back same time next week, 7 o'clock on Monday the 15th of June. We're going to be doing atrial and ventricular anomalies. Um, please, as I say, we're doing this free of charge. We want these webinars to continue free of charge. Um, Charlotte's just put some links up in, in the chats there. Please, if you haven't already, do give us a review on, on, the, on the platforms. It does help customers find us. It helps us book our courses that I was trying to plug earlier. Um, and it means we, we bring in money that we can, we can use to keep running these because they're not, they're not free, unfortunately. So um, the, there is going to be a Q&A session after this. If you don't want to join, you're more than welcome to leave. Thank you very much for coming. It's great to have so many of you here this week. Um, really kind of you to give up your Monday evening to come and listen to me rabbit it on. I hope you've learned something. Um, and we hope to see you again next week. If you want to hang around and ask questions, then, um, then I'll bring up the next slide. Uh, we can do the interactive Q&A again through this. You can type in, uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the chat. So you're more than welcome, everyone. I'm just seeing the chats now. Uh, you're more than welcome. I'm glad you've all learned something. 
and we'll uh, we'll carry on again next week as i say feel free to catch up on our youtube channel or through our website if you've missed any of the previous sessions Up. more than welcome wendy any questions folks so you can either do it through menti.com or you can um or you can put it in the chat fantastic so i attended a chest pain as a community first responder the paramedic and the tech attending after um take place three dots down the sternum instead of round under the left breast never seen it done like this before that's because it's not supposed to be done like that <laughs> that's quite <laughs> that is just that's just incorrect lead placement unfortunately nothing nothing more to it than that there's uh there's never a situation where you put three dots down the sternum unless you didn't know what you were doing so <laughs> unfortunately on that one Any more questions? Uh, cheat sheet booklets. Um, I haven't come across any any cheat sheet books. As I, as I say, I, I um, I'll put another um, link, or shall I'll just put a link into the book that I recommend. Um, I I use the um, Oh. Oops. Well, crushing everything down so you can see that Alan, the 12 lead ECG, um, The Art of Recognition is my kind of go-to book. Um, I mean, there are there are some sections in there that are um, that are cheat sheets, but uh, yeah, absolutely, Matt. So actually, the, the, the cheat sheets I'm just running a little bit behind with are, are going to be free anyway. So, but yeah, um, perhaps one day we could collate them all and, and make a book. <laughs> um, but uh, Alan, in answer to you, um, I'll, I'll do my best to get some cheat sheets together. They're, they're just proving incredibly um, time consuming to do at the moment. We've all been, we've all been working flat out the last few weeks so um as soon as i get a free minute I'll, I'll get the cheat sheets in the last couple of weeks up um if there's anything in particular you want alan feel free to drop us an email and i'll, I'll try and incorporate it into that um but yeah the oh charlotte's just put the link up to amazon so that that's the book i use um whenever i'm stuck and and it's it's never failed that and uh, the website life in the fast lane um L I F no L I T F L dot com. It's an Australian website. There's a few uh, cardiology doctors got together and made a website. All right. Yeah, back of the ambulance stuff. Yeah, you're not going to carry that book around with you. Um, I, I the the only cheat sheets I've used over the years, Alan, have been the ones I've made myself. So um, I can't think of anywhere that really makes them. Maybe there's a bit of a niche in the market there. We could we could get in on. Yes, certainly. So they they are uh, they are coming. I'll get those. I'll get messages out through Facebook and and um, uh, through that once once they've been uploaded to our website. If you go to the CPD section, the um, handouts and the PowerPoint slides will be ready from there, and we'll try and make it work better next week. I don't know what Menti Beta just doesn't like PowerPoint, but those kind of things. Which drugs in the two day course? So uh, oh, it's it's a long list. Um, so off the top of my head, it's um, all the all the standard technician drugs. So you've got adrenaline, um, chlorphenamine, you've got hydrocortisone. Uh, these are all injectables. Um, we do um, aspirin, GTN, clopidogrel for your MI stuff. We do glucagon and obviously glucose gel. Um, we do um, activated charcoal. We talk about buccal medaz. We can't demonstrate buccal medaz. Um, because it's a controlled drug, unfortunately. 
Um, if you have a look on, um, I can I can email it across to you. Yeah, so I'll be email like an actor event. Well done, Matt. Yeah, of course. Um, Alan, I have your email address. I'll email you the the course specification. It's got it on. Oh, actually, Charlotte's just brought them up. Fantastic. So, um, activated charcoal, uh, adrenaline one in one thousand injection, aspirin oral, obviously cetirizine oral, chlorphenamin oral and IV. Uh, I am sorry, uh, clopidogrel oral, dexamethasone um, oral, glucagon uh, IM, glucogel oral, GTN sublingual and, and oral because you can get the tablets as well. Um, hydrocortisone injection, uh, ipidropium bromide and salbutamol and nebulizer, loratadine oral, midazolam buckle, but so uh, we only talk about that. And uh, naloxone, of course, Narcan. Um, and that's it. <laughs> that's what we cover. Uh, yes, I, th I think it is good value. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to plug my own courses, but yes. <laughs> Um, so, Alan, I don't know if you were around a couple of weeks ago. We are we are looking at um, trying to find a base up north somewhere. So, um, so perhaps we could, um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll try and obviously we'll be updating through. Um, um, so, cath lab Bieber. So, uh, sorry, the the so it'll be the 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 coronary um, the catheterization lab. So it's where they do the PPCI. Um, so where, where we take generally um, uh, the majority of people on here are, are from the ambulance background sorry so I should have I should have expressed so cath lab is when we go um, directly from the patient's house or wherever we diagnose MI we go to the cardiac cath lab and they uh, they get angiography and stents um, if they need them done there and then so um, it's coronary care unit the acute coronary unit they're, they're called different things in in um, different hospitals but colloquially they're kind of just called the cath lab which is where they um where they get in and do the do all that stuff no problem at all but yeah not every hospital has one i suppose so it depends where you end up um going to work whether whether your local hospital has a has an on-call cath lab or whether you would transfer your patients out if they were to have an mi um but yeah just for obviously if anyone else is is there that's not of an ambulance background hopefully that clarifies what that is uh, Manchester would be good yeah uh, yeah there's quite a few saying Manchester so we, we had a little look around at um, the thing is we, we'd, we'd ideally like to be in areas where they're not swamped with other other companies offering the same courses so um, which we kind of are down in the southeast of England so we'd, we'd quite like to branch out a little bit and get our own our own area so Manchester is on the books, definitely, as, a, as an, uh, an obvious next place. What's that? Oh, uh, there's not many of you left now, but certificates. If, if you want any um, CPD certificates, of course, the same... Uh, the same um, applies webinars at stc training solutions.co.uk and we'll, we'll get those organized moving to yorkshire in a couple of years well we'll have to come up and get some cake won't we so uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes beaver so if you see the winter syndrome in a um in a patient with with an mi presentation so we're talking about chest pain um looking unwell um if, you, if you're looking at this patient thinking there's something cardiac going on and you see de winter's t waves um please do treat them as a as a STEMI equivalent and and if you speak to cardiology they'll they'll be in full support of that it's just for some reason it's not particularly well taught um to to those of us that aren't cardiologists for some reason so if you, yeah, if, you if you call cardiology and say i've got somebody with acute chest pain and de winter's teeth they're gonna they're gonna say um send them up more than likely Uh, first use in pair on the drug course. Um, so, Joe, the the, the drug course um, is uh, kind of to the same level as as trust trained technician, pretty much. So, 
um, if you're on your student paramedic course, you're you're going to um, you're going to be learning a lot more drugs than that. So um, yes, it would be quite useful um, to get that kind of background knowledge, but but it will it will start to be covered in certainly in second year. If 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 not towards the end of first, you'll get pharmacology as part of that. So it doesn't go into as much detail as the paramedic degree. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't particularly advise um, uh, student paramedics to do the um, the, the life saving meds course unless you know unless they want to work as as Freck four with with life saving meds in the meantime. Um, Diane, yeah, or, or through our website, I think Charlotte will put a link up. Um, Diane's asking about the videos. <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you go down, if you go to sccTrainingSolutions.co.uk and look on um, the uh, there's a CPD tab at the top, um, and then catch up now. You can you can get them all on there. They're they're on our blog um, there, and, and obviously I'll update tomorrow with tonight's one. If that makes sense. <laughs> uh, Graham, bear with me. So the exercise near the end, inverted P's. Um, yes, absolutely. So, so there is some uh, inverted P in there. So it could be um, uh, left uh, left atrial enlargement, or it could just be non sinus rhythm looking at that briefly we are going to cover um atrio uh, atrial and, and ventricular no not this one um this one here it's looking fairly sinus in rhythm no not yet <laughs> that's the same one yes that one there okay uh, in which particular lead? So we've got negative in there. So these P waves are looking normal to me. Back again. Oh, other way. That one. More. Thanks, Diane. Nice to see you. We'll see you next week. Oh Graham, I don't know which one which one um, we're on to. So, um, so inverted inverted P waves um, just mean that it hasn't come from the um, sinoatrial node. Um, if you if you hold that thought, if you're around next week, um, uh, Graham, it's um, it's it's very much the the kind of subject that we're going to be talking about. So, oh, have we lost everyone? Oh no, let's just see. Oh no, don't worry. Sorry, just having issues with our uh, technology tonight. So hopefully you're still there, Graham. Uh, yeah, no, don't um, don't apologise. It's it's fine. It's a valid question. So inverted P waves are either atrial enlargement or um, or a, a an atrial kind of contraction signal, as it were, coming from a pacemaker outside of the SA node. Um, hopefully that will all make a lot more sense next week. But we will um, we will go into that. No problem, Graham. No problem. Okay, so um, the numbers are definitely thinning out. So thank you very much to those of you that are still here. Um, we, we do look forward to seeing you next week. If you come up with anything in the meantime, um, you can tweet us, email us, or WhatsApp us. Um, we'll be more than happy to, to help out um, if you think of anything in the meantime. Um, oh, that's good, Andrew. I'm really glad you're, you're enjoying them. So 
yes, it's great for um, it's it's ideal for kind of ECA level to to start building up, and and of course um, for those of uh, for those at higher levels that want to refresh or or haven't come across some of the terms and it's kind of really hard to to put a session together that appeals to everybody, isn't it? That from just setting out to to been doing it a few years that wants to brush up so. Uh, more than welcome Matt. I will um, pause the video there then so uh, any further questions to webinars at um, we'll stop recording there. Um, thank you very much everybody watching on YouTube uh, later down the line.